Today's episode of The Wedding Biz is brought to you by Melissa Forziat Events and Marketing. Stay tuned to hear how you can boost your sales and get more clients. You're listening to The Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Hey, everybody, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to provide you with education and inspiration. So if you missed last week's episode, it was a revisit of a very inspirational conversation with filmmaker Brett Culp. Really applies to all of us. I highly recommend you listen to it. So today's guest is KT Mary with KT Photography. She has been recognized for her industry excellence by top media outlets like Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, amongst others, and has built a thriving, incredibly profitable business that affords her the opportunity to also pursue her passion of conservation, using her art to protect the planet and save its most vulnerable inhabitants. Over the past decade, KT has evolved into a multidisciplinary creative with a highly profitable house of brands, including photographing luxury destination weddings and editorials around the globe. At one point in the conversation, she mentions Patrick Demarchelier, I hope that's, I hope I'm saying that correctly, who just days later passed away. So enjoy this conversation with KT Mary. KT, thank you so much for coming on the show like this. I've been excited to talk to you. Same. I've been a fan of the podcast for a long time, so I'm very excited to be here. Ah, cool. I like that. So, you know where I want to start is that when I looked in your website and I looked at the About page, um, you have a quote, which I thought was so interesting. Um, You said, quote, we've got a lot in common, you and I. We are adventurers, explorers, and seekers searching for something more, something bigger, grander, and more beautiful than we've ever known before. My love and my work have been driven by this search for meaning, unquote. So it, it, it almost sounds to me like you've almost like you've immediately described your avatar of the perfect client, haven't you, in a sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that on so many ways, our clients are not looking for, and I don't, I, it's hard to say that anybody's looking for, say, run of the mill or something superficial, but I think they're intentionally looking for something that is a deeper experience on in their lives as a whole, but then especially on, you know, some of their most meaningful celebrations as a whole. Yeah. And you emphasize like three words. Um, also, um, in the website, you, you talk about adventure, purpose, and soul. I mean, those mm-hmm. are just such emotionally charged and descriptive words. I love that. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And I really do for me, it is so much more with our work and so much more all encompassing in terms of not just focused on specific details of a wedding day or the hours, the eight hours or 10 hours that they've contracted us. It, it really is a much deeper venture as a whole of bringing beauty into the world and intentionally seeking it out as well. Yeah. Well, and, and also you've got another cool quote by Simon Sinek. You say the combination of your why and how is as exclusively yours as your fingerprint. Can you say more about that too? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think it's really interesting when we think about our approach, and that's something that probably most photographers and creative entrepreneurs will, will talk about a lot is how they do this or how they do that and how they do it differently than the others. And a lot of the times what we find is missing from that conversation is truly that why, that deeper motivation, uh, that deeper purpose of really what is uniquely driving them. And I think that Oftentimes, when we see the most powerful work, there's a signature of that added. And even if you don't know the full story or the full motivation, that you just see that level of passion or depth to work. And that's what can really make it extraordinary. And so I think that when we're able to bring that into our work, it not only helps us to perform at a much higher level and and create more meaning for the people that we're creating it for, but also it's just going to resonate more as a whole and have more impact. Yeah. So what is the why for you? I mean, did you have a passion for photography when you were real young? How did this start for you? Yeah, really, it it did start kind of being a documentarian um, and just a creator as a whole. I've always loved creating from painting to pottery and eventually a point and shoot camera and, and later in a dark room in my high school where I really got exposed to it. And I had a photography teacher who really took me under her wing and and really pushed me to take it to the next level. 
And really, I think what what kind of started it was this idea of just trying to capture a bit of the beauty in the world that was around me and really kind of bottle it up and vessel it, if you will. And that has, has certainly continued and really then brought together my true why, which I'm really passionate about um, creating impact about conservation, about our planet and endangered and threatened wildlife. And so I've really been able to through this skill set that I've learned through photography and through learning and growing a business, been able to kind of merge all these things together. And that's where I think the the real kind of magic happens. Yeah. And I, I definitely later want to come back to your con- conservationism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that's real interesting. I want to talk about your fine art prints and all of that. But, you know, coming back to when you were starting, I, I read somewhere that you assisted some really major fashion photographers. Is that right? And that's where you got some really good insights? Yeah. After that photography high school class, I ended up at a, a competition. It was Vocational Industrial Clubs of America at the time, which was everything trade you could imagine from automobiles to photography and ended up winning at a state level and then a national competition, which put me on the path to photography school. And in photography school, you kind of pick a a direction or a niche. And at the time, weddings were certainly not what they are now. They were still in church basements with white right. tablecloths. And yeah. uh, so I that, that wasn't even an option for me. It was really, okay, I'm going to go and work for fashion photographers. So I, after photography school, set out and just started knocking on doors. And uh, at the time, also, it was a very, it still is, male-dominated industry. And as you can imagine, as a photographer's assistant, your main occupation is carrying lots and lots uh, of gear. Yeah. So, you know, being being a petite girl um, was, you know, not exactly boding well <laughs> for me to get these jobs. But I um, am persistent and ended up working for quite a few fashion photographers and ended up traveling the world and and then even working for some amazing photographers like Patrick de Marchelier and um, and others that just, you know, are considered some of the greatest of, of our time. So what, let's just, uh, with Patrick for a moment, like sure. what did you learn from him? I mean, I'm sure there's a million things, but w- what really sticks with you today that you learned from him? Yes. Uh, so interesting that you say that. And I've talked about this a lot that um, he really was a master of delegation. I remember uh, one shoot in particular down on a Miami beach where we are there at, at sunrise and every piece of equipment you can imagine, makeup's going, all those types of things. And I think maybe it was more around like nine or nine thirty. you know, he shows up and literally walks straight from a car straight to set and starts shooting. And so he really did, um, especially I think in his older years, really became a master of focusing on what he could uniquely do and what his true superpower was. And also, um, he was a true craftsman in the sense that he wasn't really bothered by the fuss of, you know, which camera or which lighting thing. He kind of knew what he wanted, no fuss about it. And it was really about guiding those models. And so I think I always just loved how straightforward his approach was. And I think sometimes as especially photographers with the tools and this light modifier and this thing, we get so caught up in the details that we really sometimes miss that big picture. And I think he was a master of that. You know, it's interesting while you're telling me this, I'm thinking there's a book that, or an audio book that right now I'm listening to the author is giving it. And it's, I think it's called taking the leap by Gay Mm. Hendricks. Yes. I know that very book. Oh, do you? Oh, that's yes. I love Gay Hendricks. I just read his conscious luck. Another great one. You'll have to add to your list. Oh, I didn't even know about that. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Conscious luck. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, But it's interesting, you know, for people listening who may not be aware of the book, how he talks about finding your zone of genius as opposed to your zone of excellence, you know, which is really interesting. I mean, like for myself in my life, I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time, but there have been these, you know, lanes that are really comfortable for me that I'm really good at. But then when I think about, well, what do I really love and what is my, what is more unique even than just being excellent? Like, like he says, your zone Mm -hmm. of genius. Um, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to read that book a second time around. Yeah, I'll join you. Yeah. So how, why weddings? Like, how did you end up getting, adding weddings to the list? Yeah. It's so it's so interesting and it's, it, you always just have to laugh about how you come to decisions in your career. But at this point I had been a photographer's assistant and this, the industry also was changing during that time. 
I was in that field for about five years. And in that time, digital literally was created and introduced. And so I, one of the photographers that I worked for pretty much as his first assistant in Miami Beach was super progressive when it came to technology. And he had the very first Kodak camera. And literally, we built out a makeshift Pelican case. And I was running cards, you know, also while scrimming a model and really got to kind of grow with the industry and learn all these new skills. Later, I became a digital tech and even did some production work and things like that. And ultimately, after five years, I was really feeling like it was time for me to focus on creating some of my own work and not just being a part of other people's shoots. And through one thing or another, kind of got pulled into the world of weddings that was really going through a massive shift. This was right when Style Me Pretty was being born and everything was just kind of really shifting and becoming more progressive. And I remember at the time thinking, well, you know, as a fashion photographer, you know, I'm going to pretty much live on planes and I I don't want to do that, which is I have to laugh because I'm a destination wedding photographer and I've logged, I think, 170,000 miles on planes last year. Um, But that said... Yeah, and that's a slow year of traveling (laughs) too. That's a slow year, yeah. So so I always have to laugh at myself. But part of it was also a desire, and this comes back to your first point about some of those things that I talked about, a deeper sense of meaning and a deeper purpose. And um, the reality of most fashion campaigns is the shelf life is extremely short. Um, the the long term plan is is not there. There's um, obviously the work you know somebody like Patrick is shooting or, or you know Alexi or something like that. Those are really people that are operating at the top. Their work is of course uh, has a much longer life and legacy, but that is not what most fashion photography is about. And so I really was wanting to kind of be my own creator, really also be more involved in the creative side of that con- of creating that content where with the evolution of digital in fashion photography, you became much more of a button pusher than necessarily that creative director as well. So Um, It was a bit of those things that I kind of got drawn into it. And then um, also I had just such amazing resources through all those years of working in this industry and being able to meet so many people. So I had so many great relationships that I was able to kind of just get started in kind of a really fast rocket ship style jumping into weddings. And it really took off from there. And, And I fell in love with really kind of being that creative director and that creator and being in charge of really kind of the direction of my business. Well, and you brought up digital. I mean, how do you feel about digital versus film? Yeah, it's been such an interesting ride and it's been really fun to watch from this standpoint of there was no digital, there is digital and uh, film is not dead and, you know, film versus digital and then embracing hybrid and, and all of those things. And Um, my philosophy has always been very simple, which is using the best tool for any given situation. And there are times when I'm feeling less inspired, when I'm feeling like I'm not seeing it the way that I want to see it or, or something like that, or I need to slow down and kind of reconnect to the intent. And I love film for that. Um, yet there are times when I'm walking backwards down an aisle and the light's changing like crazy and I need to work quickly. And man, digital is fantastic when it can, with these new cameras, grab hold of somebody's eyes, focus as they're running away from me. There's just remarkable things you can do with it. So I have always been a bit of a techie at heart. And I think all those years of working as a digital tech for fashion photographers really instilled in me the need to be technical and to understand that aspect to be able to perform well. So I, it's something that I love. And I think is one of the most fun things about our field is that we can really kind of geek out on all these different mediums and tools that we get a chance to play with. So are you switching between the two then, depending on the situation? Exactly. So anybody that's worked with me, um, I look like a little mini RoboCop on a wedding day, and I always have about three cameras hanging off me at most given times. Um, And that's so I can really kind of play between the different things. And I still love my 35 millimeter black and white. I still love my medium format. I still love the new digital that I'm running around with too. So I embrace them all. So... Let's talk about lighting, composition, and style. You know, what what is your perspective on that? Again, I know it's a big topic, but generally speaking. Yeah, it is a big topic. And it's something that's evolved over the years. I think in the early years, it was really about 
I think like most people, mastering the basics and really learning how to be consistent, how to be technically sound and and efficient and all of those things before starting to kind of push out of that comfort zone. And so once I really kind of had that signature style in place, once I really had felt technically, you know, the work is sound, it's solid, it's it's got a calling card, then I have continuously tried to push myself outside of that box and challenge the different approaches to lighting. And I think that's what's most exciting right now in our industry is we see a lot more of that because the tools have allowed us to get more progressive to kind of push outside the box uh, to uh, even do things like have harsh shadows and harsh daylight together and even things like Lightroom and the different editing platforms we have are allowing us to do better work with that because the tools are simply allowing us to where I think in the past we haven't had as much flexibility. And so I think it's really fun to see kind of where we can push the limits. And I always like to kind of go for the solid thing that you know works and then do something a little bit wild or creative. And so creating the space in your project plans, in in your shoot plans to be able to do a bit of both is, is usually my preference. Yeah. Are you looking to boost your sales or get more clients? Check out the Create Your Most Profitable Marketing Strategy course from marketing expert Melissa Forziat. If you feel disorganized or overwhelmed with your marketing, if you feel like you're leaving money on the table, or if you just want to get more word of mouth going for your business, this online course is perfect for you. And I only work with sponsors whose work I've thoroughly checked out. And so I know that with Melissa's guidance, you will create your roadmap and answer questions like where to market your business, what systems to create, and how to follow up with every client or potential client in your pipeline. As we all know, weddings are about relationships and marketing your wedding business should be about relationships too. Now, usually a course as detailed as this would be priced in the thousands, but to make it accessible to small businesses, Melissa is making it available for only $247. Plus, as a listener of The Wedding Biz, you can use promo code WEDDINGBIZ to get 10% off. So, if you are ready to go to the next level in your business, click the link in the show notes at theweddingbiz.com for Melissa Forziat's course, Create Your Most Profitable Marketing Strategy. Again, go to the show notes of theweddingbiz.com for Melissa's incredible course. Do this today. Isn't your business partner your husband, Chad? It is. What is his role? How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Over the years, that's morphed and changed. He's um, kind of whatever the business needs at any given moment. That is Chad. Um, but it started out with him coming in and starting to shoot with me full time. And so we've been doing that for a, about over 12 years now. So he is a full fledged first shooter in his own right. And we really now at the the level where we're shooting weddings, we really are partnering and, um, kind of dividing and conquering in, in that sense on a wedding day where he's really got his skill set often related to a lot of the scene setting shots or flying that drone or those types of things. And where I'm more, of course, focused on the people and the posing and things like that. And he manages a lot of the things like the equipment and the packing and all of those types of things. So we really have our, our set roles within the photography realm. And, and then we you know, have continued to grow the business in other facets. And he's been a part of every step of the way with that as well. Well, and I'm thinking, you know, in terms of your travel and destination weddings, I mean, what a perfect situation. Yes, you know, I mean, I, I hope you add extra days when you go to beautiful parts <laughs> of the world just to hang. Yeah, in theory, that's always the goal. It's not always what happens. Of course, uh, when you travel a lot, you do start to miss your bed and your dog. So it's it's a great thing to come home as well. But we do really never take for granted what we're able to do together. And I always question if we weren't working together, how long I would necessarily still be in this role because I I do think it's very challenging for the people that have to leave their partner, spouse, or family every weekend. And even though you are going to beautiful places, not having your person to be able to share that with, I think would be a a big challenge. God, you know, it's interesting. So I have a music company and I, 
you know, we have destination weddings every once in a while and wild corporate stuff in Vegas. You know, we do things out of town and I've got one coming up this weekend. And it's interesting, the bra- the, the groom's mother called me about three weeks ago and she said, you know, why don't you bring your wife? We'd love to put you up where we're staying, you know, which was like Aww. the ultimate place. Yeah. But I thought to my, but Katie, I thought, no way. I mean, I thought because, <laughs> no, just because I managed, like we have four, four events and lot, different bands yes. and all, I have so much going on. I designed this spectacular thing for this couple. And I, I can't imagine also having my wife there while I'm doing the business. And so I get what you're saying, but how do you maintain a balance between your business life and your personal life with him? Yes. Yeah. And what you're describing is so true. I was just talking to another vendor about that recently, about how then they were, they brought their wives and their wives aren't part of the business. So then they're kind of in, I call it like game mode, you know, you're preparing to hit the field and you're, you're going through your mental checklist and doing whatever you need to do to make sure that you're going to be able to execute. And the wives are going, Oh, you know, and you know, talking (laughs) about these things. And they're like, Oh, it was just not a good situation. So I do think for us, um, we had to learn really quickly how to transition from, we are just goofing off right now. And it's the end of the day and we're having that glass of wine to, we're talking checklists because we need to talk checklists right now. And so what I think initially there was this idea that they do have to kind of be these separate things and there's this balance to it. And what I've learned over the years, and at least just my personal experience of it has been that feeling like it has to have all these parameters and, and kind of boundaries almost creates more resistance. So, you know, if we're at a nice dinner and we need to take a call because that's what has to happen right now, the the nice thing is, there's a level of understanding of, of what we do and kind of what those priorities are. And anytime, especially we're traveling for a client, you know, that's going to trump anything that we're doing. And so while we really try to be intentional to carve out Sundays at the dog beach where we're not looking at our phones and, and things like that, we're also very realistic that we are in a luxury service industry and that that often means that it's going to ask things of you. And the nice thing is we are both in, in complete awareness and, and togetherment around sometimes what that entails. Yeah. You know, I, I also, I want to go a little bit of a different direction here, you know, kind of where we started a little bit. We talked a little bit about uh, starting into being a conservationist. And, you know, I saw on your website, you talk about um, building, as you call it, a thriving and highly profitable business and being an impact driven creative endeavor. What do you mean by that? Can you say more about that? Yeah. Well, I think, the first part is that profitable bit that it, it took me a lot of years. And I think it takes often uh, a lot of photographers, a lot of years to really realize how important the business component of it yes, all is. Yes. <laughs> and once you start to really focus on, okay, I'm focusing on being profitable. I'm focusing on revenue and things like that. I think there's this underlying feeling that maybe you're stepping away from your creativity or stepping more into focus, you know, a profit driven business owner versus a creative who's seeking to create amazing work. And what I really found was when I was able to create a more profitable business and get more intentional about the success of that business, I was also able to simultaneously create more impact around the things that really matter to me. And when I did both of those things together, it started to also become that purpose, that motivation of, well, why do I want to continue to push the ceiling on profits or revenue. And it is directly tied to that impact. And so you can really quickly, all of a sudden, make that a more meaningful motivation, which really drives your success. And and when you create more success in your business, what people don't realize is often that is truly what allows you the white space to have more creativity, to be more inspired, all of those things. So at the end, it gives you everything that you desire. It's just kind of figuring out these pieces as you go. Yeah. And I, I'm obviously, you know, with Chad, you've got your, your business minded, obviously, as I mean, both being a creative and a business. And it's so hard to balance those two, isn't mm-hmm. it? I mean, it's like two different sides of the brain. And, you know, I know we would love to just be creative, but we have to be profitable too. Exactly. And, and I think for me, I learned that I am the most creative when I am the most prepared, the most planned, the most yeah. organized. Yep. And when I think we have this reverse idea, well, I will, let's focus on the cameras or focus on the film or focus on the Instagram or those types of things. But we know that when we are suffering in terms of our 
mental well-being, in terms of our um, mental health, or in terms of our capacity to create or being inspired or all of those things, when those things suffer, everything else just goes down. So I think sometimes if we can really start with how, how do we set ourselves up best? Well, I, I typically, for me, and I think a lot of people are, if I'm stressed out about money or I'm unsure about if I'm going to be able to you know, book the next year, or if my business is going to be successful, then it's a lot harder for me to show up confident and create my best work. So I found that really creating that space of a, of a structured, secure, profitable, thriving business has allowed me to then, when I do need to step into that creative role, I can do so feeling very focused and very intentional about that and not worried about those other things because it's all taken care of. You know, with the level of business that you're at, do you still have concerns about that? I mean, about money and about, are you going to be able to book the next year? I mean, do you still have those kind of uh, emotional thoughts? I would say different concerns. So that's, that's the beauty is as you continue through all these things is um, like they say, the, the bigger you get, the further ahead you get. Um, so do the problems sometimes. Um, so while it's not, oh gosh, am I going to get before it used to be, I remember thinking thoughts like, am I ever going to book another wedding? You know, And this is like really early on, but all those kind of scarcity mindset thoughts. And while I don't have those types of things, you know, it's certainly shifted to, are we, you know, financially planning correctly? Are we retirement planning correctly? Are we um, making sure that we're now we're doing things for the, you know, if we just started taking the next level of, are we quarterly planning enough? Are we forecasting our finances and looking ahead of, you know, how can we do this better? And so it's definitely different, but I think, um, I don't think there will ever be a time where I go, oh, I'm, you know, I don't have to think about that anymore. It's just, it's just over there moving because then I'm, I feel like then we're being reactionary. We're not really being intentional. Yeah. Do you see yourself retiring someday? I mean, what would that look like for you? Yeah, I think it would, it would just morph. And that's where I've already planted so many of the seeds that we are really see as a long-term vision. And and that is our continued um, print work and work inside of conservation and education. Uh, also continuing to shoot in different areas. So we've kind of returned to those fashion routes and done more editorial and lookbooks for designers and things like that. And so I definitely want to continue to push myself into different uh, creative arenas that challenge me and ask more of me in terms of lighting and creation and things like that, but also in different arenas. And that's why I love things like education or running an e-commerce shop because they all do have their own unique challenges that wedding photography hasn't taught me. So I've, I, I'm kind of a learning junkie. So that's my favorite part about continuing to expand into different areas. And in terms of e-commerce, I mean, you have a virtual store for fine art prints, right? Correct. And is that related to what you call render loyalty? Is that the same? Yeah. So we currently have two fine art print shops, if you will, render loyalty being one. And, and that work is all focused around threat and wildlife. Uh, currently, right now, all of our partners are in Africa. And essentially, we've partnered with some of the top conservancies in the world, the, the leaders in conservation that are uh, kind of spearheading how we can protect some of these most iconic and vulnerable species and went there and photographed the threatened animals that they protect and are selling large format pieces of work and donating 20% of all revenue back to them. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. So just, just a few more questions, KT. Um, sure. So earlier you mentioned mental health. Do you have a morning routine? I do. I'm a huge fan of the morning routine. And what is that? Yeah, so it it does kind of differ time to time. Uh, at the end of last year, I found myself in a bit of a crunch with editing, as a lot of people can after a, a, the crazy year that was last year. And I switched my routine a little bit, which meant getting up even earlier at 5 a.m. versus normally I'm about six or something. Yeah, wow. But okay. <laughs> The, the first thing I do is, you know, get up, um, of course, you know, water all the normal toothbrushing things and like that, but then meditating. Um, I am a big fan. It's Insight Timer, which is the weirdest name for what it is, but um, it's a lot of guided meditations. And I really have kind of been drawn to those recently, usually anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. I have two books that I read every single day. They're kind of a one page a day type thing. 
And then I also have a journal and I typically will do a short journaling followed by I write all my goals every day and all my affirmations every day. Um, then usually some cuddle time with our dog. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, what a great way to start the day. Yes. So what are the books that you read a page from? Yes. So every morning I read a page from Marianne Williamson, A Year of Miracles. And those are really great kind of daily reflections. Also, the self-reliant entrepreneur, and I'm going to say his last name wrong, but John Jantish, those ones are actually by the date. So, you know, if you miss a day, you skip to today's, you know, March 29th, we would read March 29th. And it's really kind of prompting really great quotes from some of the most iconic authors um, of all time. And so I love that too, because it's very, it's kind of tying business with literature. Um, and so it's a really interesting one. And I get a lot of unique ideas from these various things. And then once in a while, I'll also have a book that's a bit more introspective right now. Um, it's Victor Frankel's, I believe it's a man's search for meaning. meaning. Um, yep. Yeah. And so I'm reading a f- however much time I have um, of that before. And then when I was doing the 5 a.m., I'm kind of in the middle right now where we're doing 5 a.m. And then I typically go and I work for an hour. And this is my most creative work. It's the work that is best done when there's no distractions. And I found that to be a game changer for me. And so then after an hour of that, then it's time to feed, walk the dog and then go exercise for an hour. So what time are you starting your, I don't know, the day after all of that stuff? After the exercise, come back, shower, then the goal is typically to be on the computer by nine. Sometimes that's 9.15, but we um, also do intermittent fasting. So that takes away the need to cook a Uh, breakfast or anything like that. Most of the times we're just making a juice. Yeah, save some time. You know, it's interesting too, when you talk about meditating, when I started, I mean, I do transcendental meditation, so it's 20 minutes and I'm supposed to do it two times a day. I do it once a day, first thing in the morning. But I used to be very reactive and I found that after, I mean, there's, as you know, there's so many different benefits to meditating. But, you know, in terms of how it affects my business and my personal life, that was one of the biggest things was just being less reactive, you know, not being so impulsive. Which is so interesting that you bring that up. I think it's a lesson that we can all always continue to relearn. And I just had a, a situation over the weekend with a little scratch of a car and, you know, one of those things and a very reactive person Um, kind of coming at you, you know, emotionally charged and angry. And it was such a good reminder of, and, and great lesson to see the proof of the work that we've done, because same thing, didn't take the bait, just kind of sat there and let them, you know, go on and, and sorted it out and was really talking to my husband and partner, Chad, and just saying, gosh, you know, it's, it's just such a miserable way to go through life, to be so reactive and to let everything kind of just derail you and, I think that that's something that we all can continue to cultivate. And especially in our job where people are counting on us and high pressure, high stakes. um, I think it's one of the most important things that we can do is to continue to cultivate mindfulness and, and do what works for us. And I noticed that when I travel, we were just in Mexico the week before last and, you know, staying up till two, three in the morning with every event. um, And then I come back and getting back into that 5 a.m. routine. It's like, you know, you're just flipping it on its head and, I notice that when I'm out of that routine, it really affects me negatively. So it's so worth it to stick to it. Well, and I love what you said about, you know, in the, in the middle of your morning routine that you do an hour of just creative stuff. I mean, cause otherwise we don't get to it. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Yeah. And when I can be creative early, I feel like, okay, I've done it. Now I can go deal with the business. And it's so true. And this is all the, you know, if you need to write content, if you need to, Um, brainstorm ideas or really think about how you're going to build out your next website, all that stuff that's really asking you to do the deeper, more creative business thinking. That's my favorite time for that. And even just the difference of not having the phone pinging or in our case, Slack pinging or anything like that. um, It really makes a huge difference for, for me. Oh yeah. What about a night routine? Do you have some kind of an evening routine? Yeah, I'm not as intentional in the evenings as I would be. I would say that we are very, very um, passionate about cooking meals when we're home. So most of our shutdown routine really comes down to once we're done with business stuff, um, a lot of the times I'll pour a glass of wine and we will 
cook for over an hour or something like that. And it really is about kind of just decompressing from that day and really continuing to kind of wind down, if you will. God, I had that same routine with my wife. That's nice. I mean, at the end of the day, after we both done what we need to do during the day, mm-hmm. that's what we do. We kind of come together in the kitchen and just take our time and make a meal. So um, last question for photographers listening, what gear are you currently using? Yeah. As of the time of the recording of this, because I am one of those, I'm not afraid to experiment with new things and always love to test and try. Um, but as of right now, I am still relying on my solid, you know, lead film cameras, which is the Contax 645, the Canon 1V. And with the Canon, I did have to scale back on lenses because I ended up switching my digital away from Canon. So it's kind of a weird thing now that I, I do carry some Canon lenses and some Sony lenses. We, we bring a lot of gear everywhere. So I still have my long lens for my 1V. I still have a a 50 and a 24 to 70 for that. And I really love those lenses. And then for the Sony, I'm currently shooting the Sony A1. And I love prime lenses as well as their their 70 to 200 as well. And then use a cool little adapter to be able to shoot 100 macro on both that and the 1V. And that's the main things, you know, in addition to all the various lighting. I love um, Loom Cube for cute little video lights. It's amazing how powerful those have gotten. And those are the main kind of workhorses. Mm. Well, geez, we covered, <laughs> KT, we covered a lot of ground in a half hour. The gamut. <laughs> yeah, seriously. This was really fun. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, it was really enjoyable. So, well, gosh, well, thank you so much for uh, doing this with me. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I feel like uh, we could exchange reading lists and and routines as well as we find more things to share with one another. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thanks. Take care. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my conversation with KT Mary. Be sure to check out her website at ktmary.com. That's K-T-M-E-R-R-Y.com. And also there are other links in the show notes at theweddingbiz.com. Her social media handles, particularly on Instagram, is KT Mary. And again, in the show notes, you'll find more. And you'll also see event pics that she provided in your cell phone's podcast app or again at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And if you can think of three good friends or colleagues who you feel would benefit from listening to this interview, please forward it around and give a top review wherever you get your podcast from, because that helps people like you to find the podcast. And finally, if you could subscribe to The Wedding Biz, mostly on Instagram at The Wedding Biz, and we'll catch you next week.